I'm going to read quadrant 44. The mighty Mahmud, the victorious Lord, that all the misbelieving and black hole of tears and sorrows that infest the soul scatters and slays with his enchanted sword. The indwelling self, I'll read the paraphrase. The indwelling self, having once conquered the senses, extends its dominion over vast territories of consciousness. Ranged in opposition to the spiritual conquest are all the forces of delusion. There are doubts in instilling wonders, fear, sorrow, and worry. Try constantly to cloud the human spirit. The warrior self, after decimating the enemy, ranks with its great sword, discrimination. He is held on all sides by the forces of life. All the victorious Lord. So here, uh, he is trying to say that the indwelling self means ourselves. When the reaches of our soul or spirit tries to reach to the God, and when he learns uh, to be more in the God contact. It's like he's flying, he starts flying like a free bird in the vastness of infinity. And uh, here the vastness of infinity means it is like super consciousness when we are meditating and we try to reach at that level. While reading this, I felt that it is like a bird when hatches from the egg and when it learns to fly. And once he starts flying, the sky is the limit. So similarly, when we are meditating, trying to learn to have God contact, and once that soul attains that level, that whole infinity, that consciousness is unlimited. And he gains the bliss. But parallelly, one more thing is happening is that as spirit is bounded or identified with the body, he has to face the opposition also. And that opposition is pulling him to the, in the other way. It's like saying ego consciousness and is at work and he is creating all doubts, thoughts, worries, mental fears, which keeps that soul from soaring upwards. And it's like a chain reaction, I feel like when our soul is, when we have fears, the fears for protecting ourselves, our ego, mainly fears come out of that, that I want to protect, I want to be good. And in that case, in, in so, he becomes anxious, anxiety further relates to fears, sorrows. And finally, that soul ends in suffering. And here he has to fight all these things and move towards that bliss. And one more interesting thing, uh, here it is said that as we learn to dive deep, we get a, I, I will say that we get a gift, a sword of discrimination. And this sword helps us to fight and emerge successfully to, uh, to fight our daily battle and to discriminate what is right and wrong and we try to come out of it. And I also would like to highlight two lines from Expanded Meaning. Here, uh, he has also given the tool, the main tool for doing this is our strong will. So how strongly we concentrate and keep away our thoughts, deluding thoughts or all sorts of thoughts which are interfering us, interfering in us to reach higher uh, levels. 
so uh, willpower is going to help us to achieve that and that is written in the first line that the person must be strong will to drive away the mind paralyzing fears and sorrows that would sack and destroy his inner peace and later on it is very beautifully said that once you try to learn understand that if the evil part in us wins like then the first thing what he what is at stake is our peace and contentment and then the life goes into chaos and so the divine love and virtue if those two uh, generals here they are called as loyal generals who will help us to fight the battle and if they win the battle then there is a harmony and we are in the bliss this is what it is <laughs> <laughs> thank you bhagat that was that was it. that was good the uh, i mean i had a comment that uh, on it is is uh, he he's saying here we we're we we're all fighting this battle this you know between the battle of light and darkness and you know uh joy and versus sorrow fear all of those things and and we're given a sword you know how you fight with the sword and then it's that sort of discrimination and i was i may, i mentioned right at the top you know bhagat sri well uh right before you came that i was just at another a function uh, speaking uh, uh uh on a zoom call and we were talking about uh and then and it, it applies to this how when we does how do you discriminate what is the, what is that sort of discriminate well, how do you know we all of us every moment you could say are faced with this choice of how to do right or wrong or good or bad how do, what is the what's how do you discriminate what is that sort and we were mentioning in this other function that it's inward and upward those actions those decisions those things we we do in life you can you need to judge you know you can't judge it by outwardly well the rule says or the scripture says or this says i mean it's a start it's a beginning but to really discriminate you have to come to understand within yourself is this action is this decision i'm making is it going to be taking me in the direction that my soul wants to go that i well actually the soul doesn't go with that i in this embodiment to want to go toward god realization does this is this what direction am i heading am i heading inward and up or i am i going out in worldliness and you could say downward and that's the that's the, the ability to develop that sensitivity to be able to discriminate between those two things within oneself is a great great tool and you could say it's a gift you might say that comes but it's it's something we possess already we all have the innate ability to discriminate we just don't always have it uncovered or unsheathed you might say <laughs> we have to take it out of its sheath <laughs> and uh that's our job and uh but then uh but once we can have that then it, it acts as a light it's the light in darkness that score of discrimination to guide us in the right direction of course it takes something more too and when abi will get to that we all also have to choose to 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 go in that direction we can perceive it because many times we're stuck oh i know i should do this but i don't necessarily do it <laughs> that's the other part of it but at least to be able to see the light and that's inside each one of us and we're un we unsheath that sword god and helps us and maybe this to guru you could say and helps us to unsheath that sword so that's what that was my observation anybody else have some comment on this one uh, it's a a very good uh, yes 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 riti you have to unmute yeah yeah good evening daddy and good evening everyone 
I was also pondering over the same thing about uh, deciding. Uh, I mean, good and evil would we call it a relative term? I mean, is it Absolutely. the social conditioning that we? I mean, everybody is brought up in a different. So my evil may be your good, and your good may be my evil. I don't know. So I, I think what uh, uh, Bhagishri has just said when we go in and we do our daily meditation, I think we uh, uh, we become wiser, maybe. And uh, the, we get in touch with our inner selves and uh, keep the social conditioning away and decide for ourselves what is good and what is evil. Because that's a duality that we all like facing. And we don't know what it is. Somebody tells us, but we have a questioning mind. And he says, this is good. And we say, no, maybe this is not good. So uh, this is such a, <laughs> I don't know, opposing. It's really an opposing family. And we are actually, we are always... And that's what disturbs our peace, the inner peace. That's what disturbs our inner peace most of the time. We're all looking for that inner bliss and peace. And But I think doing satsang and being with people who are uh, on the same track, uh, it's very easy. And you feel that most of the time that I've seen once I've joined Ananda, I, I feel most of the time, most of the people who are there in my community are all thinking in the same way that I do. So even though we come from diverse uh, social conditioning and we've been brought up in a different thing, but I don't know. I think that's the thing about uh, being in a community and uh, being with like-minded kind of people and it helps and uh, enhances our clarity about a lot of things in life. But <laughs> this, is the, this is the universal universal challenge for each of us to be able to discriminate and decide that but you know one thing god gives us life and feedback <laughs> to ultimately be able to understand what is the right thing to do you know and oftentimes you can't learn the right thing to do until you do the wrong thing too many times and you say that's not the right thing <laughs> and so you could say the universe itself is yeah, kind of teaching us to discriminate. <laughs> Anybody else want to comment on that? On that, that's a good question. How do you know right from wrong? How do you how do you do? How do you determine? So it's something all of us face. It's Joseph. I think Joseph was okay. I, yeah, right. We're we're on my screen here. Let's see. I got. Oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me. Discrimination is um, not just an intellectual understanding. It goes far beyond that. Um, I will liken it to the Sanskrit word, viveka. Viveka. So it's a kind of an inner knowing. So it goes beyond the intellectual or rash, uh, rash, uh, radical understanding. It's a kind of an the or perhaps I can use what is quoted here in the key to meanings. I love uh, what uh, is being described. Um, under the last paragraph, uh, last, uh, last paragraph, an enchanted sword, two, uh, page 205, that uses the word so revealing discrimination. So it's like so revealing. I mean, this is the first time seeing so revealing. So references are common, but so revealing is like, whoa, it's rather illuminating. It has a certain flavor of which is, it, it ties to what I felt personally in my spiritual walk, which is the inner knowing. So it goes beyond the words, the rationale, and you just know it. And it's a kind of a light, like you're exposed to the light. And, uh, you know, so... Yeah, you just you just know that uh, you you just able to see the you know um, the the truth from the untruth for the falsehood just like that without the reason. But deep, it's more intuitive. So that is my 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 uh, my take. Well, you know that's a good point you make there. It's so uh, bringing up that idea of soul revealing, soul uncovering, meaning it's. The, the perception of the right and the wrong thing is there already. It's like the light is there already. We don't have to get it from outside of ourselves because it's within us. We have to reveal it. It has to reveal itself. And the sort of discrimination 
is so revealing it, and we and we recognize it once it's revealed we say oh and you isn't that how it sometimes you have that experience in life where you just recognize something that was there all the time but you just didn't see it and then all of a sudden it just catches you yeah you know, it, it just yeah. catch you right yeah and then you say oh yeah, not that you you are going for it, it just catch you yeah so it's the other way around yeah that's what they say is it's memory you know shritti is like you remember what the right you know yourself your true self oh it was there all the time but i had forgotten now it's revealed and i see i was blind and now i see <laughs> there you have a question here yeah i did did you yes so uh, in the expanded meaning like uh, swami saying uh, that these uh, constant doubt instilling vandals and it's almost like other saints have also described satan as an enemy that never sleeps and if we have to fight it with discrimination is it true that the less we fight the more blunted our sword of discrimination gets and the more we keep it sharp the more uh, it's easy to stay in a discriminated state well i said i mean just off of hand that obviously sounds right you know you have to use a tool in order to keep it uh you know to keep it uh, uh from rusting you might say your <laughs> tool rusting and getting uh, useless yeah i would i would say that so but that you know when you use discrimination that takes conscious intention mm-hmm. you see and and you can't you can't avoid life and think everything is going to work out by retreating from consciousness that's a, that's a movement towards subconsciousness in order to be super conscious you have to use conscious intention which means energy energy and will but it's a refined in a refined state so it's purification of that and the removal you have you have to help remove those things that keep you in the darkness it doesn't happen without your conscious cooperation mm. so thank you So well, that's Bhagash- very well explained, Jaji. What now, <laughs> Bhagashri? That sum it up in two sentences. I have tried. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I have to sum it up. Straight. Let's aim for getting the great sword of discrimination to drive away our fears, delusion, sorrows. and cut away the uh, attractive uh, clothing now this point i missed out actually but i i will first complete this so let's with the sword of discrimination cut away the attractive clothing of the sense pleasures which our spirit is surrounded with with steady fast meditation ah that's good that's good that was actually that was probably one long one sentence that was good that was very good and uh, i just missed out the uh, uh, one line but very beautifully it is written swami ji has written that this portrait tells us that there is a subtle clothing of sense pleasures around our uh, spirit like and we have to cut it out and open to the bliss this is very beautiful line yeah. well you know the the use of the image of a sword implies a martial spirit you know somebody a warrior a spiritual warrior spirit so it's not a passive thing <laughs> so you have to you know go forward you know and uh, uh and with the, and engage okay I, yes shall i go for next oh are you ne- your next yes okay let's do the next one 45 so in this quadrant we might get the answers which we were discussing earlier about the opposition and like so let's see what we have in this the quadrant 45 but leave the vice to wrangle and with me the quarrel of the universe let be and in some corner of the hubbub couch make game of that which makes as um, which makes as much of the that is 
<laughs> How do you decipher that? <laughs> Let's see what Master says. <laughs> so, uh, Paraphrase says, let the theoretically wise wander in endless argument among dusty exhibits in the Museum of Theology. And let scientists puzzle to their minds, content over the paradoxes of reality. Universal truths cannot be easily grasped by the frail tendrils of human thought. Laugh then at the need at the need to puzzle over anything, while others argue and harangue, slip away to some distant, quiet place, sit a while in deep inner silence, meditate on the joyful, loving nature of infant. Why let your head be bowed by weighty riddles that never can be solved? Why take things so tragically? Look upon life as an amusing sport, for sport evidently is what life makes of you. <laughs> so here, I mean, when I read this, I thought this is for me because. <laughs> Most of the time, I end up in thinking and analyzing why this, why that. But here right. he's completely saying, why you worry about all this? Just go sit in quiet place, get in touch with uh, <laughs> God, contact, super conscious, get your answers, come back. It is as very simply as yes, said. But uh, coming to the point, here he is suggesting that... Uh, there will be discussions, there will be scriptures, theories, different theories. Scientists will be coming up with many uh, revelations, but only all these things are not going to give us exactly what we are looking for, that is the spiritual truth. But you will have to work for yourself, just not by reading and understanding. You have to work for it yourself. And for that, Instead of wasting time in all this, go sit somewhere and get in word, meditate, and get in touch. So, like in last uh, few uh, last part time where we were discussing, like how to discriminate and how. So, what I feel here is that here he has given us the way that more and more you learn to uh, make that God contact in the meditations, like more and more you reduce your thinking and train your brain to cut out the thoughts and get in touch with that inner peace and silence you will yourself get the clarity and then there will be no doubts like who is saying what will not matter because everybody's perception is going to be different his conditions are going to be different and uh, for each situation there is going to be right and wrong both the sides and all finally is right, means there is nothing wrong. So it is for ourselves like we get in touch, we get our clarity and we try to act accordingly to that soul guidance. And all this will happen intuitively, like when we are in that phase, in that bliss, intuitively we are going to understand whether I am doing it right or wrong. But the major hurdle is our thoughts and all other uh, things around our uh, soul, spirit. So here, again, in expanded meaning, uh, one point uh, here he has said, uh, Swamiji has said, that instead of getting too much intellectually into understanding, because as you will uh, start getting to understand that way, one thing will finish, another thing will come up. And many things will keep on coming. And over the period, you may get into uh, egoic self, like, yes, I am understanding everything. And you may lose the direction altogether. And at the end, again, you will be fully confused. And you must, in, in, through this, you will stray the path. Means, uh, purpose will be defeated, in short. like. So here he is saying is that just transcend that intellect. So don't think too much. And this is very helpful for me. <laughs> and uh, yes, touch your inner strength. 
and the silence in deep meditation. And you will uh, reach at that point intuitively. And one more important point is that uh, in the expanded meaning is that consider this life as a game. Means consider it as a sport. Whether you fail or whether you, su you succeed means whether you lose or win, it doesn't matter. Just enjoy what it is. Learn the rules of game simply and play. <laughs> and play, play with uh, uh, one more very important point in the last line I would like to read is that whenever the ball comes your way, throw it back again with equal energy. So here Swamiji is saying that yes, don't feel bad or let it like it is going to be there. Uh, failure or success, it doesn't matter. But when the time comes, you have to stand straight and with equal energy, you have to face the situation peacefully and come out of it. Fargus, <laughs> 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 well, that was great. I, I mean, I appreciate it. I thought, I'm glad you made that last point about sport and, and yeah, he said, don't, don't take everything too tragically. You know, life can be a tragedy, can be a comedy, <laughs> it can be a melodrama, it can be all of these things, you know, don't, and that the choice is ours how we want to proceed with it. Any other com any comments that people would like to make? This, this is that I noticed that uh, I think, uh, I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that he's using the term wise in both ways here he refers to it uh, to the uh, you know to the intellectuals and i think in other places he's referred it also to you know the sages or the saints <laughs> so that is <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. interesting yeah i think i think so a lot of it you know the spiritual path of all of these things either this way that is you just have to have perspective you know step back and see things in perspective you know, and it, it's all a balance you know, you keep in the, in the middle path and you keep balance, but always keep your eye on the, what the real goal is and not get distracted and, uh, and enjoy it as you, as you go. It's like life is like a tightrope, you know, and you have to walk that, but you have to keep your eye on the goal. <laughs> okay, but you want to sum that up and then we'll move to the, what the next one is, the next quadrant. Now here are two sentences. Understand life is easy game of failures and success, defeat and worries. Care not whether you win or lose. Just play the ball when it comes to you calmly, but with equal energy and enjoy the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Now, who's, who's next? Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, Aditya okay. Ji. Okay. Here we go. I also just want to say that JJ, I like the sense of humor Omar Khayyam has. Yeah, yeah, it does seem that way, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, every now and then it comes over there. Okay, so I'm reading Quatrain 46. For in and out, above, about, below, is nothing but a magic shadow show, played in a box whose candle is the sun, round which we phantom figures come and go. Paraphrase. The images on a movie screen seem real. The people, the homes they live in, the distant mountains, the stars above. Yet they are nothing but plays of light and shadow cast onto the screen by a movie projector. The same is true of so-called real life. Our bodies, so loved and cosetted by us, are nothing but phantom images. Earth, sun, stars and galaxies, all are projected onto the vast screen of space from a light booth in eternity. Birth and death are no more real than their movie counterparts. As each one of us dies, other phantom figures will appear to take up the light and shadow story where we left it. There is no substance at all to the manifested universe, except in as much as shadow shows and movies are real, as appearances merely. The vast drama of time, 
space and active life is a colossal fiction mm. and uh, <laughs> that this is a theme i think that master often would start many of his talks on that this is a dream and it seems so real and uh, a few points i've made over here from swami's expanded meaning uh, that swami shares that the sun he says we are in a limited universe the physical universe and he says over there the sun is playing the part of making it all seem real and again master and swami both would say that in dream uh, we can sometimes we feel that we can create the dream make the dream go where we want it but he says what is the then the difference between life and our dream reality he says well life in which you and i find ourselves is part of god's dream so we are not so much in control till we get in tune and so he says you have less control over there uh, this is a three dimensional dream he says where to make it more difficult god has added the senses and such and unlike a movie which starts and ends quickly he says this movie picks up each morning when we get up from where we left it so it seems very real but he says it is in the end he says it's a dream and then towards the end he asks the question that he says do you want to live a good dream or do you want to create a bad dream and basically suffer the consequences so i think what omar khayyam is saying is also something that master and swami have addressed that all of this that we see including ourselves is just part of a motion picture like bhagyashri was saying don't take it seriously do your part your actors in the show and understanding that live in the world but not of it i know i thoughts anybody have a thought i think this this my thought is the image of this uh shadow show or or that was in the old days when you know they they had those sort of shows now it's the movies and, and uh it's a really a good one but the, the but it's so real you know it uh, in the in the movies you go to the movies and you you get engrossed in it but you know it's not really real so you can enjoy it and because it's not it's not real you know you can step out of it at any time so that allows you to enjoy it but at this this movie of life we don't have that ability to step out of it or at least we don't yet have it and i think that's what makes it unenjoyable because you're you're stuck in it and that's you feel all this pain if you could step out of it i think we'd enjoy this much more <laughs> but uh, uh yes we wouldn't be slaves to it jagdish aapne and up i think good evening everybody friends and welcome back to uh, home uh, jai ji aapne and up you know what what i thought about when i was reading uh, this portrait is obviously continuing the uh, discussion on the illusion of the um material world right but you know the, the word that really caught me on portrait 46 on page 210 is uh just nothing but a magic shadow show which is what we're discussing but that word nothing um i actually thought that when i when i compared this uh, portrait to portrait 38 i'm specifically referring to page 177 if you want to turn back and look at it with me um uh and and I'll read it just a paraphrase the first couple of sentences divine freedom seems at first an annihilation nirvana a void or wasteland of desirelessness so it's almost like um trying to arrange my thought but basically it sparked my thinking because recently I had a talk with a uh, a buddhist scholar and I wasn't trying to like you know uh argue with him but it was basically like well his whole point was like yes 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 you know you find rama you find that sweetness in god but you still have to go it's not the end there's still more right to to the end and my point was like well, well what is it you know can you describe it like is it is it really nothingness and he's like no 
but there's still more. So I feel as if there's something like sweet in concreteness with um with saying that there is nothingness in this world. But yet somehow I guess some people find inspiration when they describe nothingness in the afterworld. So I just thought it was really neat that this chapter, for me at least, um, kind of brings the two paths like together, or there's at least a common ground to go there. So at least let's agree then like that that this what we are experiencing is really nothing. I mean it's it's an illusion, right? It's just like a shadow show. But what happens afterwards is almost like is anybody's guess, depending on like what your heart calls for. It's a little bit rambly, so I forgive you and I thank you for listening, friend. <laughs> Very good. So Aditya, what would you sum it up as? Oh, uh, the two lines here are, life is a dream. Let us create a good one so it's easier to wake up from it. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Or maybe life is nothing but a dream, something yeah. like that. <laughs> okay, well, number 47? Yes, Jay, Jay, I'm taking that one too. So 47. If the wine you drink, the lip you press, end in the nothing, all things end in yes. Then fancy while thou art, thou art but what thou shalt be, nothing, thou shalt not be less. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had the same feeling that quickly, <laughs> where is the paraphrase? <laughs> <laughs> So paraphrase, if the wine of ecstasy and the soul's final union with spirit both end in nirvana, the state in which objective appearances cease to exist, why imagine even now that thou art that? Nothing, no thing, never wilt thou be less in nothingness. Thou shalt realize the truth at last. I am. The death of everything is the birth in eternity of that which alone is eternal being. So quite a jnana yogic uh, approach, I think, uh, trying to explain the inexplicable but I think just like what Jagdish was touching on, that uh, we, like Omar Khayyam is saying, that the more you meditate, the more you feel that, drink that wine of bliss. And finally, when you have soul communion, you will enter the, all your desires will be fulfilled. You will enter the state of nirvana. And then fear not that you have suddenly no more desires and you are you are in the state of not even defining yourself as, as anything because wait a while and like swami used to say you will be filled with bliss bliss will fill that void which nirvana presents initially so this is what i think he's trying to say over here yeah, it's interesting. You have this it's seemingly this dichotomy between nothingness, and I I like the word this what he he says eternal being. Now eternal being is at first eternal being is the seems to be the opposite of nothingness, but it's but it's not the opposite of no thingness, right? And which that's another way of defining it. No thingness is. Is uh, it's not a thing, it's being versus a, th a thing. So, and it's uh, eternal being is what uh, we graduate to that understanding. Satchitananda, ever, ever new, ever existent, ever new bliss. It's always, you know, new. Yeah, 
if I may, if nobody has something to add, uh, maybe I'll read the expanded meaning, which is also very brief in this case. Okay. okay. If in your glimpses of infinity, you lose all zest for earthly things, grieve not. Though a chasm yawns between desirelessness and the ultimate state of divine joy, it is a division of perception, not one made of earth and stones. It is as narrow or as wide as consciousness itself. To bridge that gap, don't hesitate, but plunge bravely into the void. Attain divine selfhood by forsaking your little self. Offer your whole being into oneness with bliss infinite. In that state, you will know yourself free from all vestiges of limitation, including those even of thought. Bliss is the ultimate realization of the soul. In that bliss realm exists a fulfillment greater than the sum of all fulfillments you have ever known or longed for through countless incarnations that you have wandered seeking your true home. Hmm. That's... Taiji, do you know who did the illustration for all of this? Oh, it's in the uh, it's in the pref in the front of the book. There it says you'd have you. Uh, uh, it it's there listed somewhere in the title in the enter in the uh, you can find it. I know that you have the like the old. Yeah, I've I've that. seen it. I've seen it, but I can't I can't find where it says. I mean, it's somewhere he's. He says, it's gorgeous. I mean, it's, it's really well done. Yeah. It doesn't matter, by the way. It's just uh, an observation. Well, uh, Adityji, you want to sum it up? Yes, Jaiji. Through ecstasy, aim to become no thing. Through no thing, you will become one with everything. Okay. Now, who has, uh, who has 48? Seema. Okay, Seema. <laughs> Jai Guru Jai and everyone. Quatrain 48. While the rose flows along the river brink, with old Khayam, the ruby will take shrink. And when the angel with his darker craft draws up to be, take that and do not shrink. Uh, I was reading uh, the paraphrase and everything, and it directly brings me to our Kriya practice, you know, that, and then you, when you read paraphrase, you realize that somewhere it is talking about what you are trying to uh, do in Kriya practices. You're, you're practicing your energy bringing up and down and trying to withdraw all your senses to the spine, and that's what is also in paraphrase the lie it starts with follow the teachings contained in ancient law lore. withdraw your consciousness from the senses to the spine for there flows the river of life if its waters redolent with sweet meditative raptures drink daily with khayam the vintage wine of ecstasy then at death then you leave this body to meet to meet the angel of Christ consciousness and are offered the elixir of even deeper ecstasy. Be not afraid of that new state, nor nostalgic for the old, but fly courageously from your bodily prison to unite your soul with omnipresence. That's marvelous. <laughs> I mean, it says everything <laughs> about what what is the real purpose, of, especially all of us who are on the path. It it tells us in this short paragraph. It tells us what we are supposed to do, not to worry, not to just follow what what you are told. You know, follow your guru, follow your guiding angel, and uh, yeah, that's what I think. Uh, I I get the. The message from here 
I'll read mm -hmm. uh, expanded meaning. And then others can please add your wisdom for me to understand it more deeper. A bird long accustomed to living in a cage hesitates to fly if the door is open. The soul similarly long caged in the physical body falters when the time comes for it to leave body consciousness. O oh, devotee, be fearless. Follow the wisdom inspirations given you in these secret teachings by Omar Khaya. If you pursue them sincerely, and if the wine of his instructions intoxicate you, be not apprehensive when the path leads to greater heights. A deeper ecstasy is being brewed for you in the exotic, purified regions of your innermost being. That's beautiful. <laughs> so, I mean, in my notes, I was just saying, I, I kept writing again and again, preparing for your further journey, your higher. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this talks about that. It is just taking you towards, you know, how do you prepare? By doing all these small actions, what you do wh while you are practicing, not just practicing Kriya in the sense of sitting in that Kriya practice, but practicing everything as a, a package, you know, that how do you practice not detachment? How do you practice being centered? How do you practice being not getting affected by, you know, uh, all these fears and habits of mind and just free yourself and just follow your guiding angel. And for us, fortunately, gurus and all our spiritual teachers and guides. That's what, yeah. So do you want to sum that one up? And I think we probably have time for one more. Practice detachment with complete faith. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, go forward in faith. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I have said I wrote I also wrote keep calm and move on. Remain non-attached. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Yeah, what well, you want to do the last one today? Or are, who are you on forty eight? Or is that okay? The uh, Why don't you Why don't you finish it off with this last one? Sure. It's all a checkerboard of nights and days, where destiny with men for pieces plays. Hither and thither moves and mates and slays, and one by one back in the closet lays. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I'll read paraphrase first, but I was, <laughs> I was just reading and I must have read this for 10 times. <laughs> like, oh, it's saying that, you know, back and forth, back and forth, and you're, you're taken back, you know, there, and you're sent back at the right time. You again progress, and then you, you go back, and <laughs> that's, that's what was coming in on my mind when I read the checkered board and nights and days. And, and then beautifully, the, I, I like the image, the way it has been illustrated here, and, and the patterns and design on it also is very attractive. I mean, it attracts attention. The alter, okay, I'll read paraphrase. The alternating nights and days of this rotating earth and the alternating sorrows and joys in people's lives are like a checkered board in multi-dimensions. The rules of the game are set by karma, the law of cause and effect. Though often it seems to our understanding that karma or destiny merely plays with our lives. Over aeons of time, stars and planets are moved by inscrutable law from point to point in the galaxy. And people are moved over many incarnations from lower to higher positions and back again. Karma arranges the reunion of friends lost to one another in the dark night of death. Karma withdraws souls back into the astral world again when their time on earth has expired. 
as chess pieces when captured are removed and placed in a box. So destiny, when removing people from the board of life, places them in the secret closet or resting place of the other world. My, my <laughs> don't worry, you will reach there. Just <laughs> <laughs> does, any, does anybody else have comments? <laughs> you know, how would you possibly understand this poem <laughs> if you didn't have some guidance like that, like this? This is so so uh, amazing. <laughs> One thing I can say is that intellectually you can, I mean, people can go on and on on this, but I just love the way you can simplify it, you know, and you can just understand and apply it to your own realities. What I, I just lo love about. Yeah, so. it's, yeah, it really is that way. So, okay. How would you sum it up if you were to sum it up in a couple of sentences? Uh huh. I have written, remain non-attached with highs and lows, sorrows and joys. Don't be afraid of trials in your life because they, because as, as these trials are taking you back to the closet, mm -hmm. rest and come back. Yeah, I think that seems to me, I, I get the theme out of, actually out of the whole uh, Rubaya, that I, this theme of this world is a this world is an interesting place. There's so many things going on. We're coming and going and all, and we and he's in, he's saying step back, step out of it, and you know to you know to find what's real behind it all. But that uh, the lifetime after lifetime we just go on and on and it. It's just pretty much the same thing over and over again. It's it's quite a very gyanic view, you might say, of just you know taking that of a yogi, just stepping back and be a yogi, and uh, eventually, as Master said, you get tired of it. It becomes monotonous after a while. So why not you know why not cut to the chase, you might say, and and uh, solve the riddle of life and and uh, drink the wine of ecstasy. It's a, you know, it's a sense of perspective that he has looking at it all. Any last comments? We'll call it a day and uh, come back next time. Okay. Yeah, so okay. when you were, just one thing when we were discussing about unsheath or uncovering, you know, that's when I, I felt that, I mean, we will have to go on till that moment, you know. Mm -hmm. to that the soul is uncovered and you get in yeah the, yeah that. revealing so you know it reveals itself reveal thyself reveal thyself exactly yeah, exactly okay well until next week we're all uh blessy you have your duty let's find some volunteers here some of you who mm -hmm. uh, have been a little bit uh, reticent where you invite you to step forward okay Joy Thank to you, all Jay. of you. Yeah. Thank you.